next time. You may not see me, but Spencer Hess. I'm taking on some other folks uh, onto the channel as kind of like a new thing I'm doing. So my channel will occasionally host other people's work uh, that resonates with mine. And uh, Spencer, you may remember, uh, was uh, on the channel a while back. I've interviewed him, I think, twice. So you can go back and, and check those out to see who he is. Well, but. this is a question that's near and dear my heart. What is a university? What should it be for? So when I first read, um, there's two essays about this in um, the Christian Existence Today book. When I first read number one, um, it was so much about the ideal university that I at first got angry and I'm like, nope, that doesn't happen, that doesn't happen, that doesn't happen. And then I realized that he was putting forth a true ideal there, that he does understand this isn't the way universities, liberal arts colleges, or Christian colleges generally operate right now, but he's putting forth an ideal of, of how they should. So, for instance, he talks about universities being characterized by the virtue, virtues of honor and truthfulness as ends in themselves. Um, and they see their purpose as cultivating character and sort of um, modeling this type of character for younger people. So uh, honor not only would include just, uh, you know, not cheating on a test, but being an honorable person, okay? Also, he says, those who occupy the hierarchy of the university are there because they are distinguished by their willingness to expose themselves to the truth by developing the skills of critical intelligence. Okay, as an ideal, I think that sounds glorious. Also, he says that uh, universities should pursue knowledge for the sake of the good. So um, in Hauerwas's mind, there's got to be like an understanding of the good, the good society, the good for people, or at least there has to be the quest of understanding that and a certain amount of a vision of what it, what it is. Um, and that would be what the rational life is for, is to think about the good, um, and to figure out how to obtain more of it. And then he also says that professors and students in the ideal university um, have the integrity to, quote, not sell their wares at the current cultural store, um, which I take to mean that a university shouldn't um, pursue whatever the latest fad is or sort of conform to whatever the popular culture demands at the moment. But it shouldn't follow, in other words, it, it should try to lead because it has um, people within it, both faculty and students who are ideally pursuing a deeper understanding of what the good is for themselves as well as society. So so he puts forth this ideal and I really as as an ideal I have no um, I have no real complaints as far as that goes. Um, and then in the second essay in particular you start to see Harwas contrasting the ideal with the reality of universities um, and liberal arts colleges. Um, and here he explains that honor is kind of inherently an aristocratic value because it implies that people based upon their position and even their rank, and he makes the point that universities are still structured according to ranks of, you know, sort of importance or authority with the president of the university at the top and then the, you know, the provost, the deans and then the, you know, the senior professors and on and on down to the, to the undergraduate students. And with each rank, okay, in the honor way of thinking, um, each, each rank, each type of person um, has its own, uh, has its own like virtues to pursue. So for a student, it would probably be, you know, academic honesty, taking the truth seriously, trying to learn, being, being um, a good fellow uh, learner in the classroom, and so on and so forth. The university professor 
um, would have a lot of responsibility in this way of thinking for uh, the development of the students uh, under their tutelage uh, and the university dean, for instance, would care about uh, the students' education as well as the faculty's development and have in mind a concept of the good that's, that goes beyond the marketplace. Okay, so uh, Hauerwas says this way of thinking, this honor way of thinking, that it, sort of the skeleton is left in the, the structure of the university, this has collapsed, and it's partly due to the fact that we live in a, um, a democratic time and that democratic values have, um, you know, become more and more mature and widespread within the society, democratic values, okay. Um, over time to the point now where uh, the people within, say, the university don't necessarily see it as their job to embody a particular um, virtue of honor because they don't necessarily see any responsibility uh, on the part of their own occupation relative to those beneath them, right? Because we're all supposed to be equal. And I guess, I know, Hauerwas's implication is that is a very convenient way to um, avoid responsibility. And we replace it, he says, with an ethic of dignity in which we affirm that every individual in the university, students, faculty, staff, and administrators have human dignity, which who can argue with that? That's good. And, and even from Hauerwas's Christian perspective, maybe particularly so. But the problem is that dignity is a very amorphous thing that we talk about a lot, but doesn't necessarily translate into actually treating people with respect and, you know, helping them to develop to the best possible um, person they could be. Uh, and so it becomes hollow. It's hollow in a way that honor couldn't be because honor, when it was really grasped, really meant something, you know, based upon the ranks and the position that you were in. You had a moral responsibility to behave in a certain way and to make sure that your um, the people who were under your care uh, were were treated appropriately and and their knowledge developed and their character developed, okay? So if we say we all have equal dignity and it's sort of a hollowed out dignity, we can say to the student, it's up to you, you know, you decide. I respect you, I respect, I respect your intelligence. Think whatever you want. I'll expose to you all kinds of ideas, but you're on your own about what to uh, think about them. Hauerwas thinks that's an easy way to abdicate responsibility. He also says that universities tend to focus on rewarding sheer IQ. Um, and of course, in a, in a real sense, this is standardized testing. When you go to a lot of universities, you are admitted on the basis of a standardized test score. And if the score is high enough, then you get a scholarship and you get invitations to the, say, the honors program and other things. And uh, so you are rewarded for simply having a high IQ, which is, I guess, more what those standardized tests measure, as well as measuring just how well you can take a test. Um, but the focus is not on wisdom, and Howard Wass wants to, uh, wants to distinguish between the two. Just because you're intelligent doesn't mean you're wise. We should know this by now, because a lot of highly intelligent people have done terrible things and make huge mistakes and seem to not be able to um, control themselves, right? Like, or, or why, why control themselves if they don't even know what their aim is as far as the good for themselves and others? Um, so a lot of intelligence is poured into sheer profit-taking um, or fame-seeking or other things that don't really, arguably don't even benefit the individual at their core, and definitely don't benefit other people. 
Also, he says there's a focus on training to serve the immediate needs of the individual in society as they perceive them. Okay, so that's just, I mean, that's so common sense. Like if you've ever been to a university now, so many uh, pander, you know, to the latest fad. They try to appeal to students and recruit them on the basis of dollar signs. You know, um, they basically are not willing to defend the liberal arts as good for students in and of themselves as a way to develop themselves and deepen themselves and to have a more meaningful life. Rather, even the liberal arts get sold as, to the extent that they still exist in a lot of universities, they get sold as somehow developing practical skills, which they do, that's not in dispute, but, but that, they, that that's their main value. And there's sort of an implicit capitulation um, to the public's view that, that's developing and pre getting pretty strong, that liberal arts doesn't have any useful purpose. And, and he points out along the way that Christian um, colleges used to be bastions of the liberal arts, and, and many of them still are, but a growing number are switching out the liberal arts for practical degree programs like nursing and healthcare related services and, and business and marketing and things like that. And their liberal arts component is shrinking. I, and I know that's the case. I've, I've looked at more than a few of them <laughs> along the way. Um, so uh, he says, this is the university selling out to the current cultural store, all right? Um, and not really contemplating in a serious way anymore its, uh, its duty to promote a full, complete education that allows people to develop. That means, he says, that students come away unchanged. They may have new skill sets so they can get a job, which is good, but, but they haven't changed in their core. And that, to me, that's so sad because they spend four to five years of their life, and some of the most the years of a life, typically, you know, they come in their um, late teens and into their 20s, when if they were in the right context, they would be extremely curious and could potentially get excited about learning. Um, although maybe a little bit later in your 20s, you're a little bit more prepared for that. It takes more guidance for a lot of younger people to get on that path. But in every single year I've been teaching, I've known several who were in their late teens and in their early 20s who were just on fire by learning. And they, they, were, they were on fire for learning because they came to the university with a background that had already set them up for that. Or they had done it for themselves somehow when they were still in high school, okay? And so they came and they started looking around, using the university as a way to like, figure out who they were, you know, and to develop their knowledge of what they valued more. Uh, and, and that's rare, though, I guess is what I'm saying, and not necessarily promoted by university, because universities see their jobs as uh, basically preparing people for the workforce, okay? So wh why, why change their character? And in fact, as Hauerwas points out, a university that talks about helping students develop and change their character or solidify their character and understand the good more would be considered by the students as well as everybody else as kind of oppressive, as doing something kind of undemocratic at this point. Um, but uh, if the university is just mainly about job training, then enters the question, which a lot of people are asking, why go to a university? Aren't there other ways to train for jobs that are that take less time, that uh, cost less? The answer to that is yes. And I think this is one of the reasons why universities are starting to lose out uh, to other opportunities, including just plain self-teaching. Um, now, you know, Harawas mentions that students will come for the college experience, because this is something that universities sell more and more. Come for the college experience, which means come for the four or five years for the parties, for the football games, for the socializing, um, 
And just to not have to get down to the serious business of having a job or career that's 40 hours a week, although I know plenty of students who work at least 20 hours a week just trying to pay their tuition. But, you know, he is right that there's, a, there's an element that's pretty strong of selling the college experience. And I think this comes out even more now that students are demanding, well, I shouldn't say demanding, there's a growing uh, respect for um, classroom as opposed to online instruction. I have no problem with that. I think that classroom instruction is great, but I suspect that the main reason why students are tired of online instruction related to the pandemic, that for many of them, it's because they're tired of sitting in their apartment rather than being out doing these social things. And who can blame them? But learning in and of itself can take place online. Learning in and of itself can take place online. And many of you are using my channel to do that. It seems to be really common amongst people in their 20s and 30s to self-teach through YouTube and other means like this. So obviously learning can happen <clears throat> online, but the college experience, which has become this rite of passage in our society, can't happen online. And so universities are selling that as a primary uh, vehicle, and a lot of their money is made with the college experience, whether that's living in the dorms, uh, the cafeterias and restaurants nearby, right? All the events, including the football games, baseball games, basketball games. Um, those all attract not only students, but members of the community and beyond. And that makes the university and the community money. Again, not a bad thing, just not necessarily what the university's prime mission should be about. So he says, colleges become cafeterias. And I thought this was so, like, such good writing. And it, it explains the current state of the university so well. I just, I have to read this, okay? He says, thus the modern university or college depends on convincing those who come to it that any need they have can be met. Yeah, even if it's like uh, therapy, right? There's a lot of therapeutic stuff that goes on in universities. In such a context, the university or college cannot help but appear to be as a giant, um, a gigantic cafeteria. The student comes to it as a cipher, that is, somebody, somebody that's empty and and needs to be filled up with stuff. Okay. The student comes to it as a cipher to be filled up by pushing trays along the line, taking a salad of math or computer science, um, some potatoes of philosophy just to make sure they're introduced somewhere along the way to some big ideas, a little corn of literature to ensure that they will be recognized as educated people, which always comes in handy if you're trying to have a business conversation. Um, and finally, some meat, a major in business, physics, or history. I think this was written a while ago. I don't think history would be on that list anymore. The traditional pre-law major. Ah, there we go. Pre-law, which puts one on the appropriate career track. Wow. You know, universities have become this cafeteria where you can pick from a variety of courses. Universities have also just kind of really like loosened up on what what they require so that, you know, typical undergrad has to take 40 to 60 hours of coursework that's supposed to be somewhat um, mixed, but they can choose, they can choose so many courses um, to fit the various kind of loose criteria that they can come away not having been exposed to philosophy at all, for instance or um, physics, or history, or anything in particular, okay? Um, so, I mean, one of the big ideas that you come away with is that universities pursue short-term relevance to get butts in the seats and tuition and grants and corporate money, okay, and all of that, um, 
instead of acting as a cultural institution uh, that that helps people understand the context in which they live so that they too can avail themselves of all that has been learned and thought about before. He says, the university is the way a culture insists that its forebears have not lived or died in vain. That does not mean they must agree. That is, that doesn't mean the students have to agree with their forebears. They just must remember that they are a part of the conversation. So literally, Hauerwas thinks, and I generally agree, that the way that universities often operate now um, represents a sort of death of culture. Culture has to change. It cannot be simply the study of the past for the sake of, you know, sort of venerating it. But to study the major ideas and the great and beautiful things that people have thought, as well as the dangerous and ugly things that people have done and thought, is, it seems, necessary to to understand one's own context and to not make the mistakes of one's forebears, to avail yourself, instead of having to reinvent the wheel, of knowledge that has accumulated before, okay, and maybe most importantly, it literally, when it doesn't do that, it literally is erasing the contributions of so many people, some of which are up above here. You know, how many students will really read and discuss Marx or the ideas of Frederick Douglass or Lao Tzu or the Federalists? Okay. Many, many will get out of the university with ever, without ever thinking about those things. And they, I think, are part of the ones, a subsection of the ones, who wonder what the heck is wrong with our liberal democracy now? Why are things seeming to be kind of topsy-turvy right now? Why are people so angry and troubled? They have no way of really answering that beyond getting mad at whoever they disagree with on whatever other side they happen to be looking at. So universities uh, are not doing everything they could to help that social situation. Now, at the end, Hauerwas asks, are universities to blame then for the state of our larger society? And here he says, well, it's not that he's taking all the blame away, but he says universities, including liberal arts colleges and even religious schools, reflect the culture around them. So a lot of the damage is done by these same dynamics happening at the lower levels of education and in the families, in a, the, the workplace. All of us are responsible, in other words. All of us and our misplaced values and our lack of depth are responsible. And it may very well be that to get an education in the things that matter, you have to, after your college degree, when you have time, start learning on your own. This is what people used to do. And I think they're doing it again. And it's quite refreshing to see. Um, but I also hope that in the long run, Universities can carve out a place for themselves to be leaders of culture and society instead of followers of the lowest common denominator.